Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hyperspace on Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven. I want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening, and a special thank you to webmaster and producer Keith Rowland. And my special guest this evening is Linda Godfrey. Linda S. Godfrey is the award-winning author of over a dozen books on strange creatures, people, and places, including The Beast of Bray Road, Weird Wisconsin, Weird Michigan, Real Wolfman, True Encounters in Modern America, and Monsters of Wisconsin. A former newspaper reporter, she has been a guest on dozens of national TV and radio shows, including Monster Quest, Sean Hannity's America, Lost Tapes, Inside Edition, Sci-Fi's Haunted Highway, Monsters and Mysteries, Wisconsin and Michigan Public Radio, Coast to Coast AM Radio, and many more. She lives with her husband on the edge of, of southeast Wisconsin's Kettle Moraine State Forest, and her latest book, American Monsters, A History of Monster Lore, Legends, and Sightings in America, will be released in August by Tartar Penguin. Godfrey is also the author of a new paranormal fantasy fiction series, God Johnson, The Unforgiven Diary. You can learn more about this at her websites, which is lindagodfrey.com and lindagodfrey.com slash god dash johnson. And please welcome Linda to the show this evening. And Linda, how are you doing? Are you muted? Are you there? <laughs> okay, we can't hear her right this second. Uh, bear with me. Hello. There Hi. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, it's you were fading out there. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. I dropped all sound here for just a, a few seconds, so I don't know what happened. But I'm here. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. And if you can get closer to the mic, maybe that will help a little bit. Okay. Well, I've got it right here. Okay. Excellent. Sounding good. I've got a note from Keith that it sounds good and better. Excellent. All right. Well, that's interesting. What a way to start the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, weird things happen on every radio show I do electronically. I've even had radio tower transmitters go out on actual stations. Wow, that's interesting. Is that part of your energy field? I don't know. It just hmm. seems to happen. So, um, you know, that's a good if it up. is, it's without my awareness. Oh, that's okay. Well, that, that's fine. We'll, we'll just ride through it. <laughs> so how Oops. did you get in? Still there? Yes, I am. Okay, so things are sketchy here. Hello? Yes, I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Okay, she's having a hard time hearing me. Maybe I should call her right back. I hear I hear you fine now. That's weird. I, I shouldn't. No, I can hear you now perfectly. If, okay. Can you hear me? I yep. hear you perfectly, and, yes. And, and Keith says you do too, so I'll take his word. No, I shouldn't have mentioned that I have the electronic problems because <laughs> that can bring it on. So. Okay, all right, well, we'll try to run it, run it out of here. In a good way. So how did you get interested in, in writing about werewolves? Well, you know, it had never entered my mind um, until uh, it was 1991, toward the very end of the year, and I had just started writing as a reporter for, um, for a local newspaper here in southern Wisconsin called The Week, when people around my own hometown of Elkhorn started saying that or telling each other and calling the local animal control officer to say that they had seen what looked to them like a werewolf, if there was such a thing. Not that they believed in him, but the typical statement was if there was such a thing as a werewolf, this is what it would look like because they were describing something that stood between five and seven feet tall, looked like a wolf or German shepherd. It was completely canine. It wasn't, you know, part human or anything, but it, it ran around, leaped, ran walked, knelt, squatted on its hind legs, you know, which is not how you expect any kind of a wild canine in particular um, to get around, even though it's it's not a supernatural thing. They, they can do it. it. It just isn't normal for, for most canines. So when I started looking into it and discovered that, indeed, they were calling the animal control officer, that piqued my interest because I thought, well, you know, if they were just hoaxers or kids goofing around, they're not going to call the local authorities, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I saw he, um, the, the people that had been calling, there were a couple that I knew, and I knew that they weren't goof-offs or people who were likely to do this. And especially when I began to go and interview them all and talk to them, I realized that whatever these people had seen, it was something really out of the ordinary, something that scared them, frightened them, baffled them. They weren't making it up. You know, mm -hmm. some of them were still uh, afraid. And I wrote up the uh, the paper for, or excuse me, the, the story for the paper. And my reasoning at the time was um, not that I believed in werewolves, but I thought, well, 
if there is a dangerous animal out there, then people around here have a, um, they, they need to know about that for their own safety. Mm -hmm. um, if it's nothing, well, maybe it's just the start of some folklore. That's still a pretty significant thing to be able to record and kind of a privilege. Mm -hmm. And it seemed just to me that there was more to it than that, though. And I wanted to get to the bottom of it. And I was shocked that once we thought it would just be a little minor local reaction. And actually, it went national in a, about two weeks. There hmm. were, um, you know, Milwaukee TV stations, Mad all the TV stations in this state and others started, and then all the um, the city newspapers, and then I was getting radio and TV requests from all over the country. And most significant, people began to write me. And remember, this was, you know, the very beginning of the 90s when people didn't have email. Um, I didn't have an email account at the newspaper. They had to find a phone number or write, you know, with pen and paper. And they did that to get a hold of me and say, look, this is not an isolated incident. We have it here in New York. We have it here in Texas. We have it here in the Virgin Islands. I, they were literally writing from all over the world saying this is the same creature. It's a canine that walks upright and we've got it too. Hmm. So then I knew there was something really more important about this. And because no one else was really too interested in that topic um, at, at the time, I seemed to be the, the person who uh, turned into the go-to lady for for werewolf reports you know some people were calling me the werewolf lady whatever I didn't mind but I kept getting reports over the 10 years that I worked with this newspaper and they never stopped so I thought well maybe I need to put them all in a book and once I had my first book out the beast of Bray Road it just was like an avalanche of uh, because it reached that many more people mm -hmm. and since then, it's about 22 years, and I still, even though I left the, the newspaper after 10 years and began writing books, I still get um, one to three reports a week, sometimes more, you know, so one, occasionally it'll skip one, but it averages out to one to three reports a week, which I think is kind of an astounding um, mm -hmm. number when you add it up over, over all those years. They're not all equal, of course, but um, it, it's still an amazing thing to me, and I'm still seeking answers as to what this thing really, really is. Mm -hmm. and has anybody been able to videotape it? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, but <laughs> I'm just, just hesitating <laughs> because it's, it's kind of a complicated question. Um, there have been no videos that I would call conclusive or definitive. Um, I have received videos and photos that people send. A few are obvious hoaxes. You know, there was one in Michigan called the Gable Film that was um, exposed uh, w with my help on Monster Quest, the TV show. Um, I'll get pictures from people showing something that is obviously their cousin wearing a werewolf suit out in a cornfield. Um, and then there are other pictures that very could well be you know, the strange creature that the people say they witnessed, but it's either too blurry or too far away, to, again, to make any sort of a definitive uh, judgment by mm -hmm. it. So I, I ha haven't seen one, although I do get them. I haven't seen one that I can say, yeah, you know, that's um, that's it. That shows it. Right. And I, I mo really most of the time when people have these sightings, they are random and they are just um, very fleeting people, by the time they can collect their wits, even if they have a camera or a cell phone with them, by the time they can collect their wits and get the camera, focus it, usually it is out of sight. You know, it's normally running across the road or they'll see it running through a field or maybe um, it, it's somebody who's out on a trail or a hunter or a farmer and they're not, you know, they're just not standing there with the camera ready to go. Right. And, and it, they usually only last, um, a, you know, a short period of time. So people make sketches for me, which are very helpful. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really hard to get a good video or, or, a, or a photograph of something that's a moving target that is unexpected. I'm hoping that things like the new um, Google Glasses and, and uh other types of eyewear that have little cameras attached to them that you can just tap, mm -hmm. you know, and take a picture. I'm hoping that kind of technology may help us get
get oh, a yeah. good photo. Absolutely. And I don't know if you saw that message from my, my producer there, texted to you in Skype. Um, oh, I just saw one there. It said, uh, said I, my, my voice is popping a little bit. Yeah. So. If you could move your mic slightly down from your mouth, I believe is what he's asking. Right. I'm trying that. I'm, so, I just did that. Okay. Just a so heads up. Hopefully that, so I'll, I'll watch for that little blue uh, circle to pop up again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you feel this creature is a hybrid design with man and animal or, or what's your impression? No. Okay. Oh, I don't think there's any human in it. I, I don't really believe in the concept of a fully human person metamorphosing, you know, in terms of all its internal structures down to its molecular and DNA structure into mm -hmm. another animal. So, I you know, I don't believe in that traditional Hollywood sense uh, idea of werewolves. And the other thing is that uh, with a few exceptions, which I can get to in a minute, 90 plus percent of the reports do not portray anything other than a fully canine creature behaving weirdly. You know, it's not like it's got a human face and a, were and a wolf body or vice versa. Um, it has a tail. People describe the head as like a wolf or German shepherd. It walks on its toe pads digitigrade, which is almost impossible for a human to imitate. Um, it seems to be fully canine. The exceptions are when occasionally there are um, episodes where the description is a little more supernatural or um, it's doing, uh, you know, unusual things. And some of these correspond to the Native American idea of skinwalkers, which I think is a kind of magical transformation that involves maybe etheric bodies and that sort of thing, which is, mm -hmm. is very, very different. And the other idea would be that it is some type of a manifestation of a totally non-human spirit. Some people might call it an earth spirit or um, some other type of, um, of energy source that mm -hmm. is able to manifest as this creature. Right, yeah, something that might have been conjured through a ceremony perhaps even, through psychic uh, projection. So, Did you hear me on that? That's one that yes I did. Okay. Yeah, that that's one that's one thing that I I don't rule out, you know, because it's nothing that I can say that's impossible, you know, couldn't happen. Um and to me the idea of projecting, you know, this etheric or astral energy or or body double or whatever you want to call it um is a lot <laughs> easier to swallow than the fact of of uh, or the idea that we might try and change all of our carefully structured DNA into another complete species and mm -hmm. back, you know. Right. So, Yeah, it's very fascinating. Well, I know they, there is a frequency, I mean, associated with altering the DNA, and through that alteration, appearances could change. So that's a theory in general. But yeah, I find mm -hmm. it very, very fascinating, this whole topic, and I'm so glad you've addressed it through your books. Now, you've got a new book coming out in August called American Monsters. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit on that one. That one was a lot of fun for me because um, people think of me in connection with these upright canines, but uh, which is, by the way, my preferred term for them is un unknown upright canines, but the publishers generally don't see that as a sexy title. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why Werewolf gets, in, gets into the title. But right from the get-go, um, I discovered that people were not only reporting these canine creatures, but also sightings of Bigfoot, Big Birds, um, goat men, all other types of creatures. And uh, not too long after The Beast of Bray Road came out, um, I was asked to uh, co-author Weird Wisconsin with the uh, the Weird U.S. series and then um, to author Weird Michigan. And so I had to begin researching all types of creature sightings and um, things that were more to the paranormal side than, than I had been going into before. And I had this whole body of, of uh, reports and other things I'd been collecting for many, many years. And I, what I wanted to do was show that these canine creatures or the Bigfoot, um, none of these other things, the big birds, none of these exist in isolation. They are sort of a, uh, it, it's, people think of them as, as one type of creature or another, and really, the manifestations seem to um, occur in sort of the same areas. 
Um, it's very hard to research one without running into another one. Very often light phenomena, anomalies, and uh, UFOs are involved. And I wanted to write a book that sh sort of showed the whole scope of these anomalous things that so many people in this country and around the world are experiencing. Hi. Hello. Hello again. How are you doing? Oh, good. Is this any better? <laughs> it's. I think so. Tr go ahead and talk. So I've got my mic adjusted again, and perhaps the new call will help. Yay! Yes, it sounds much better. Good. Glad we were able to fix that. Yeah, me too. All right. Okay, so you were talking about your book. And right. It sounds fascinating. I'm looking forward to, uh, to having it go live. And that is in August, right? Yes, it's okay. due out um, the end of the, uh, the last week in August. I, I think the 28th is the official release date. And if people are curious, um, it's up on sites like Goodreads, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, I think, already has it. You can just type in um, American Monsters, Linda Godfrey, and it should pop up for you. And you can see it's got a really rockin' cover. I'm very, very pleased with um, the, art, the artist at Tarture Penguin did a super job on that. Excellent. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited. And to me, it was just, uh, I got to research in depth some things that I hadn't done too much, such as uh, what they call the bat squatch, which is a furry animal with bat-like wings. And I was actually really astonished, um, and I'm moving my mic again just to, to double check. I was actually really astonished to find out just how many sightings of this and other such weird things there are, too. You know, it's... There are more people that see odd creatures and phenomena than anyone would imagine because it's also my belief that most people don't tell or report what they see to anyone for fear of uh, being called crazy. Um, sometimes they're in denial themselves. They don't want to admit that there are things out there beyond our normal perception, um, beyond our present understanding of science. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a big, big hurdle for many people to overcome. And those that do, you know, will admit, um, they'll say, you know, that's the day my whole paradigm and understanding of the universe changed. I've never been the same. I think about it every single day. And I think some people just aren't ready maybe to make that sort of change. It, it's easier to uh, tuck it in the back of their minds mm -hmm. and, and let it go. But um, just, just from the numbers that have, um, you know, I kind of extrapolate that, yeah, there must be a really large number. Oh, it sounds like. And plus, you said you're still getting phone calls each, each week or you're still getting people contacting you, right? right. So that's, yes. I mean, that's pretty active if you ask me. That's amazing. Yes, I think so too after all these years. And uh, it helps, you know, every time I write another book or do a radio show like yours or one of the TV shows comes up, um, it always um, just instigates a whole new spate of mailings and, and calls. So, mm -hmm. um, it, and so many of the people will say something like, you know, I, I was totally unaware that anybody else ever had this experience. I thought I was the only one, you know, and then it's so... It's such a, a, a freeing thing for them to be able to find that they're not the only one, that lots of other people have had these experiences. And they'll usually say something like, I'm just so glad to talk to somebody who doesn't think I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And do, are, are these people haunted in any way by this type of uh, creature? Does it follow them at their house or anything? Um, most of the people who have encounters with this creature don't see it again. The the big exception is those who have sort of a habituation uh, routine going on there. And by that, I mean, and usually it's like an ice, somebody in an isolated rural or woods community where um, they see the creature on their property and then it seems to come back and come back and come back. For instance, um, there was a woman who saw it. She went out one night to uh, let the dogs out the final time on their farm and saw this upright, wolf-like creature just in the act of dragging one of her roosters over the fence. Mm. And she kind of yelled at it automatically, and it let go. Um, but ever since then, you know, it has come back and come back. And they've had their place um, blessed with sage ceremonies. 
Um, other people of other religions might have a priest come out and use holy oil, <laughs> that, uh, which seems to work, you know, for some reason. It does give people relief. Mm -hmm. um, placing lights in the yard also seems to help. Um, and then some people are actually haunted in another sense. Not that they feel that any sort of spirit thing is coming after them, but it's always sort of on their minds. You know, it shows up in their dreams. Um, they think about it a lot. And so they're sort of haunted in a psychological sense about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so is, what's the difference between a man-wolf? I guess you call it a man-wolf or a werewolf. Which, which would be the appropriate title for this? Well, I prefer the term man-wolf or wolf-man or dog-man. Mm -hmm. And I, as far as I'm concerned, they can be used sort of interchangeably because um, canine would really be more proper, but it's just clumsy. Most people don't use it, so it doesn't get used as, as much. Um, all of them are preferable to werewolf because, to me, werewolf carries all this medieval and Hollywood baggage mm -hmm. that does not really seem to apply to the things that people have been reporting to me in all of these contemporary encounters. You know, there's no um, wolf fur girdle used, uh, to, you know, to, to call up the werewolf as there, as there were in medieval times. There is not any sort of, uh, um, you know, mythos with, with the silver bullets or um, being bitten and turning into a werewolf or... The full moon, you know, none of these things seem to apply to the contemporary sightings. Um, and I'm also not sure whether it's a wolf or a dog or a wolf-dog hybrid, mm -hmm. or maybe um, all three. There's another, you know, alternative theory that I have, um, and I, I still don't know which is right, but I call this one the indigenous dog man. And in this theory, um, the creature is some sort of uh, perhaps a blend of wolf and the the long-standing uh, native dogs that we had here that were brought along with uh, the earliest indigenous people that somehow over time um, was able to adapt to walk and run around on its hind legs for some reason. And they might have found that especially advantageous here in the prairie states where they're particularly prevalent um, because think about running through prairie grasses and you're looking for deer and you're looking for other predators to watch out for, how handy it would be if you could stick your head up above those high grasses and have a look around. And then if you found something good to eat, you could then, rather than having to drag it on the ground where it's open to the risk of being dragged away by something else, you could carry it either in your fore, forepaws or sling it over your shoulder, just exactly as people have seen this creature do. Mm -hmm. They've seen them running along carrying parts of deer or um, even dogs, people's pets, which, which seems to be another uh, prey animal for them, or mm -hmm. just even roadkill. So um, to me, it's possible that natural adaptation may have um, given some certain... Uh, family characteristics, fam small families of these creatures, these characteristics that they have been able to carry on. And it's interesting because um, one supporting observation that witnesses make is that they'll say, well, you know, it had paws with claws, not hands, but they were elongated. They looked longer and bigger than a normal canine paws. And you can imagine if a canine was uh, born with, say, a mutation for some reason for slightly longer paws, it would be much easier to balance and stand and run upright on those longer paws mm -hmm. so that, you know, then the natural selection process would take over and, and repeat this. Right. Yeah. And, and I guess this creature is a predator with other animals, but, but insofar as people go, it doesn't or has it attacked anyone? In 22 years, the only attack that anyone has written to me about where it actually contacted and did some damage was a gentleman in Quebec who was taking a hike on a trail in Quebec province, Canada, and ran into one of these things. And he was just a city guy out for a hike. He didn't have a gun or anything like that on him. It was very close. And it lunged at him. But he thinks that it actually intended to lunge right past him and keep going. But instead, he sort of put himself in its way by uh, panicking. And before he knew it, it had sort of um, just accidentally torn um, the flesh on his flank and his hip. 
and he had to go to a hospital and get stitches. And he said he told the staff that a bear did it. Hmm. Um, but because he was too embarrassed to say, you know, what it actually appeared uh, to be. And they were kind of astonished because normally if a bear gets that close to you and gets its actual teeth in you, there'll be a lot more damage than that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and he sent me a picture of the scar and it was consistent with something um, that would correspond to, uh, you know, a predator's fang and that would leave sort of a jagged and and uneven tear. Mm -hmm. But in all of the cases, even though people have similarly met it on the open trail like that, or um, just been, you know, out at night for a stroll and run into one, or uh, whatever, where they were in a vulnerable situation, they'll say, you know, I thought I was lunch, I thought that it wanted to eat me, I thought it was, you know, all over, and then at the last second, it always dives into the nearby bushes, or cornfield, or woods, or whatever happens to be there for cover, and it usually is not out in the open without some sort of cover to dodge into, which tells us a little bit about its habitat. Um, And sometimes people will say, you know, I was aware that it was following me for a while. I could hear it every once in a while circling around. Um, One couple whose story is in the new book, because, of course, I do have a chapter on these things in the new book, um, both saw it when they were driving along at night, and they sped up, actually, to get away from it. Because they were afraid, it just ha- it has an attitude, which I'll talk about in, in a minute too. Mm-hmm. But they sped up, and um, the the fiance, the the guy in in the couple, looked in the rearview mirror and saw that it had circled around and come out behind the car and was standing in the middle of the road behind them, watching them drive off, as mm-hmm. if deciding whether to chase them or not. Wow, that's spooky. It is spooky, and um, if you'd like me to address that attitude, that's probably one of the uh, scariest things about this creature is that, um, and and it's something that also seems to separate it from just normal predators and animals, too, in my mind, and this is something, again, that I've heard from the very first reports, which is that people will say, you know, um, this creature was looking at me, and I felt that it was superior to me, that it was trying to communicate that um, it was better than me, that it could get me if it wanted to. They'll use the words sneering or jeering or even leering to get this kind of condescending expression. And this is something that, you know, when's the last time, you know, somebody will say, well, I saw this raccoon or a deer or a bear, and I felt that it was trying to let me know that it was superior to me. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> this is this is just something that is not normal in the world of, of wildlife as we know it. And most of them, uh, other than those very few somewhat supernatural um, examples, most of them have the normal, typical yellow, green, sometimes golden eye shine that you will get from a canine. Um, but they have this look that they give the people. And some people even go so far as to interpret it as a type of mental message. They're not hearing words. They're not hearing a spelled out precise telepathic message, but they'll say things like, like one woman who is driving past um, and slowed up. She, she and her uh, friend both saw it at the same time. And the woman who was driving said, I had this feeling that it was telling me I could jump on top of your car right now if I wanted to. Um, I had another woman who was a a young mother, um, worked for a medical office, mother of two, who saw it pop up in the ditch next to her as she was driving to work one morning. And she said she felt um, that it was conveying the message that if you tell anyone that you saw me, I will come and get you. I know where to get you. Now, <laughs> and she she was still so terrified, she burst into tears. She had tears streaming down her face as she told me about it. It was a, a couple of weeks after when I went to interview her. Mm-hmm. And um, that's something else. I, I see this sort of post-traumatic um, symptom um, um, on the faces of these people who I uh, talk to mm-hmm. that shows me they were shaken very deeply by whatever they experienced. 
Mm, that's really fascinating. It almost sounds like there's an alpha presence with these these type of creatures. Now, have they left any impression? I mean, obviously they, they've done some kind of a, a psychic imprint, but is there any bad luck associated like with a skinwalker? Supposedly if you encounter a skinwalker, bad things happen to you or if you survive it. Um, what is your And what is your impression of the skinwalker versus this, this type of creature? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I haven't heard any sort of bad luck connections, you know, and that is something that, for instance, with the Mothman, the the weird winged creature um, of of uh, Point Pleasant, Virginia, mm-hmm. West Virginia, that was supposed to have been the harbinger of doom after it appeared, this bridge went down, um, and all these people were killed. I haven't heard anything like that in regard to the Dogman or Wolfman, mm-hmm. um, but they they do seem to. Um, you know, just they, they don't seem like a positive presence to most people. You know, they're, they're more of a malign, uh, frightening type of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And do you and, think, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to go on to this, the skinwalker, but, but please okay. ask your question. Well, well I, I'll ask you afterwards. Go ahead and finish your skinwalker. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And the skinwalker is a, is a different thing. And um, the skinwalker, particularly with the Navajo people, but other um, Native American tribes have their own versions. You know, for instance, the uh, Canadian Cree um, and Northern America Cree people have their, and, and other Algonquian tribes have bear walkers. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it, there are also mountain lion walkers. Other animals are involved, and in these cases, um, I've done a lot of research, and what I've been able to find. Um, in especially in looking through texts by um, the Native American shamans themselves, and also some of the first um, Europeans to record these things, the fur trappers back in the 1600s, for instance, um, they'll sort of talk about what sounds like projecting their astral or etheric body. You know, and for those who haven't heard of this, um, there's a belief that people have not just a, a physical body and an unseen um, spirit or soul, but there's actually another double of our physical body made of a higher type of vibration that can uh, leave the body sometimes, um, perhaps when people have what they call out-of-body experiences or they're having um, surgery and they find themselves up at the ceiling looking down, it's this um, second body physical double that that they're seeing. Well, what I'm getting from many of the um, people who write about skinwalkers, bearwalkers, is that they're highly trained through um, many years of work and shamanic techniques to be able to project these bodies. And either either they're projecting an entire figure that goes out from them and does things, and that would be the skinwalker, or they're projecting uh, sort of a spirit covering that that envelops their body and sort of disguises them mm-hmm. um, and a lot of the um, in a lot of these uh, uh, legends and lore and well per- many of them would tell you it's more than that um, the training that goes on is not the usual um, what what we might call medicine man or normal shaman training it goes to a different path they sometimes have to do uh, some very dark deeds in order to be trained this way. And most of, of the people um, are very, very afraid of them, you know. And I do hear from a fair number of Native American people who have encountered what sound like the skinwalker. And one way to tell the difference is they do seem to have a rather different appearance than the dog man or wolf men in that they they do so, show some human characteristics, uh, their face might be more human-like. Um, oftentimes, they have red eye shine that people will describe as not a reflection like regular eye shine, but actually glowing from, out from them. Um, they'll have, uh, rather than paws, their um, forelimbs will end in actual hands. And they may have real shoulders rather than just highly uh, mus- muscularized upper forelimbs. Mm-hmm. So um, those, and oftentimes they're, they're bigger too. They may be, um, you know, instead of five to seven feet tall, seven to nine feet tall. Mm. 
That's fascinating. Yeah, someone told me I had immunity to skinwalkers one time. I'm not sure what that exactly means, but hopefully I won't encounter one. But I, I was going to ask you about the Mothman. Do you think there's a connection between Mothman and the Manwolf? Um, not any more than there is between one anomalous creature and another. Um, okay. I think there's sort of a connection between many of these weird wing things that have... Um, furry bodies in the center rather than uh, just the super, super large birds that either look like giant condors or giant uh, pterodactyls. Mm -hmm. There are these other things with wings and furry bodies or um, really unusual bodies that often don't look quite quite uh, um, bird-like at all. And there, there's one really well-known uh, incident that I uncovered in Wisconsin um, on the western side of the state, right along the Mississippi River, um, I dubbed it the Lacrosse Man Bat. And the person who um, had the experience actually was a Native American man uh, who just uh, had me keep his real identity private, but he goes by the name of Woe Holly. And in this case, he and his son, uh, who were music musicians, were driving home about 9 p.m. from a band practice in the city of Lacrosse to their rural home when this massive wing thing came flying right at their windshield and they thought it was going to crash into the windshield and when it, it was close enough and from their headlights they could see that it had sort of a furry body with a somewhat wolf-like head and these giant bat-like wings that were outstretched wider than the truck mm -hmm. and at the very last second um, now this is one similarity rather than smashing into them it did soar up and away from them and into some nearby trees. So it did have that um, kind of teasing, almost trickster entity-like behavior of making you think it's going to get you, and then at the last second, you know, it runs off and goes. And um, these people did feel that they were there. It, it did follow them home and that it um, sort of haunted them, if you will, by um, banging on the sides of their house. They had uh, they hear something walking on the roof. Um, they'd see flapping motions off in the distance when they went outside at night, hmm. that sort of thing, you know. And I have heard that with the Mothman, too, that people uh, would, would feel that it was tracked a little bit more. Wow, that's fascinating. That reminds me of the Flatwoods Monster, I believe. Was it 1952? They had some kind of a sighting that sounds similar to that. I think there was a war or something. I have to go and research that. But I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. Yeah, I am. That was... Um, that was a, a much we a weirder looking creature. Um, you know, it was, I, I don't have a picture of it in front of me, and I'd hate to describe it and, and be wrong, but, um, you know, it was just something very unusual. It didn't even really correspond to any of the other creatures that were seen, and it had the anomalous lights, um, it, you know, which is a, another uh, oft-observed feature. But, um, yeah, these... These flying things, <laughs> you know, it's they, there's no real, um, n no real. I'm trying to think basis to compare them to, mm -hmm. other, until you go back to some of the really ancient creatures. Um, there's a very ancient uh, creature, or it was looked upon as as a god or a demon god called Pazuzu um, by the the very first. Um, I'm thinking. I'm thinking Babylonians, and that's wrong. But um, the the right word is is not coming to my mind. But it was an ancient god called Pazuzu, and it was uh, very similar to this, with the bat-like wings and this creature that wasn't really bird-like, and um, it was a very nasty entity. And so it kind of makes you wonder if these mm -hmm. things have been around for all these, you know, uh, millennia, hiding in caves or whatever. Right. Um, you know, and then they just come out. Once in a while, my friend Chad Lewis um, and some of his friends went and explored a very little known one in Iowa. And he let me tell the story of this in the new book. And this was a very similar creature that came out of a mine, an old mine entrance in this little town in Iowa. And um, I believe it was in the late 1800s and appeared for several nights in town and very literally uh, just terrified the populace. It was showing up on Main Street. Um, it would show up right outside people's windows. It 
committed these horrible streaks. Um, posses were organized to go out and shoot it and eventually it disappeared back in the mine and uh, when it came out it flew away with a second one so there were actually two of them hmm. that that flew away from the town and weren't seen again so um you know what are these people seeing i mean whole towns saw this one um entire you know huge numbers of people i think john keel listed hundreds um as seeing the mothman mm-hmm yeah, that's pretty interesting. And I'm wondering if they're coming from the same dimensional space or possibly uh, some sort of a, a portal through another time-space continuum. Hello? There we are. Yep, you just dropped dropped off the... <laughs> well, no, no surprise the there, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, as I said, these, these things seem to happen when I do radio shows. Oh, that's fascinating. Now, I was just mentioning different dimensional spaces that perhaps they all come from one right. dimensional space. Right. There's the idea of, you know, and, and there are variations of this. Um, I noticed this very early on when I began interviewing Native Americans. Um, I talked to uh, different tribal elders and shamans and uh, from different nations when I could. And what, while they don't all have the same belief, what I did hear over and over again was that they believed Bigfoot, Dogman, and you know, perhaps some of these flying things too, are primarily what they call spirit creatures. We might call um, something from another dimension, but they say these are primarily spirit creatures. They're older than the human race. They know where the doorways or the entrances are to from their spirit world to our world, and they can come through when they want. When they're here, they're fully real. They're corporeal for the most part. They need our energy. They need to either um, frighten people or feed on animals or, um, you know, maybe like your chupacabras activity and, and suck blood from things. Um, but they need to get that energy. And then when they want to leave, they go back through the opening or the entrance to the spirit world. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's yeah, and, and that really is a very close paradigm to this idea of there being wormholes, portals, entrances to other worlds um, that really are, are uh, cutting-edge physicists are grappling with and dealing with these days uh, as they, um, you know, work out the, the laws to the universe. Um, that these other, some people call it, even even have said there might be such a thing as a multiverse right. where there are endless mm -hmm. chains of, of uh, conjoined universes stretching out like bubbles one upon another mm -hmm. and that these little openings appear sometimes at, at the places where we are uh, conjoined with these other worlds. Right. Makes perfect sense. And also, if you, if you go by the aspect of we're multidimensional beings, then we also mm -hmm. do have access to these gateways as well if we're, we're, we're altering our frequency through consciousness. So that's another show altogether. But yeah, I'm a firm believer in that. Exactly true. There's a really good book. Um, but it's called uh, Daimonic, not demonic, but daimonic, D-A-I-M-O-N-I-C, Reality by Patrick Harper, and it's spelled H-A-R-P-U-R, that gives one of the best explanations of how the, uh, the multiverse within us communicates with this other reality and how um, the, the communication is a two-way thing. Um, fascinating reading. Oh, it sounds like it. I'm going to have to pick that one up for sure. Worth it. Yeah, it's it's one of the best I've seen. Awesome. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in that. And and you know, with the man wolf, which some of it is based on folklore because they've talked they've talked about this for a very long time. I mean, the wolf man, and and then there's urban legends. So how do you um how do you merge all these together? Obviously, you have credible witnesses who've encountered something, which is um quite spooky. So so how do you blend them? How do you separate the urban legend urban legends versus you know real encounters? Well, the ur urban legends um, are usually identifiable and different from actual encounter reports because there will be certain themes that are repeated over and over and over again. Um, for instance, there's um, a very old werewolf legend that has uh, been here around the country ever since the French came. Um, the first Jesuit priests and fur trappers that came with the French repeated it and it became part of the folklore of 
the the upper Great Lakes where they landed, you know, to do the fur trading, as well as down around Louisiana and some of the um, the, the southern coastal areas where you had the Lugaroo and the Rougarou. But one of them, for instance, involves um, a werewolf usually trying to kidnap a young woman or attack someone. And the person who is being attacked or else a helper who's right there happens to be wearing a, a rosary. And the werewolf in its, um, you know, anxiety to get its its objective, uh, somehow tears the rosary, and when all the beads fall down, um, the werewolf is either killed or the, the beads form a hole that it falls through, or, you know, something very bad happens through these rosary beads being dispersed. And this is a legend that I've seen from not only Green, Green Bay, Wisconsin, down to southern states and all over. And that's how you know when you, when you get this repetition of a of certain story like that, it's probably an urban legend. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me. Which yeah. is based on a very old legend. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow, it's a fascinating topic. And have you encountered an auspicious creature yourself or anomaly that you've not been able to identify? Well, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and encounter it is a good word. Um, people usually ask me first of all if I've ever seen the man wolf and. My answer is that I think that I saw the spine of one of them. And this was back in around um, 2006, I believe, the, the summer of 2006. And I was working with um, a camera crew and some witnesses in Michigan uh, from the History Channel. And we were out on a very deserted gravel road in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by thick, thick woods. It was like 3 in the morning. And we were doing this kind of stakeout because these witnesses had seen two different upright wolf-like creatures in that area. It was probably 95 degrees. There was a storm coming. We're swatting mosquitoes everywhere. So I kind of rule out hoaxers mm. in that case because they would have been miserable wearing a fur suit. And as it was, we kept seeing like yellow eyes in the bushes and hearing big animals shake their fur out like your dog shakes the water off of his coat, you know, that kind of thing, mm. as if it was sweating. And... We had a spotlight trained down this gravel road. And at one point, I turned around. I was standing by the van where the, the camera man was uh, using as his station. He was turned the other way, unfortunately. But when I turned uh, toward this spotlight, I saw just momentarily uh, something dark enter the road. And then the spotlight caught the fur on its back just for a moment so that it lit up. The fur was gray. And it was vertical. The back was vertical. And as it finished, it ran across the road and blotted out what we later measured to be a seven-foot-tall reflective road sign that was right there. One of the other witnesses saw it at the same time. So something clad in gray fur that stood seven feet tall and was... um, you know, well enough acclimated to to wearing a fur suit, ran across that road. Can I say for sure what it was? You know, n- strictly perhaps not, but it did match the uh, description that these witnesses had given of one of the creatures they had seen. They had reported seeing one that was about six feet tall, with brown, dark brown, shaggy fur, and another one that was about seven feet tall, or at least taller than the first one, with the gray fur. Mm, that's interesting. And I'm sure they could have ruled out a bear, right? It could not have been a bear. For one thing, bears don't run perfectly upright a- right. across a road. You know, I've seen many bears. My dad's from northern Wisconsin, and I've seen bears out in the wild running, walking. You know, mm-hmm. um, it had one swipe the tent right by my head when I was camping once, and it was not a bear. I I probably would have known a bear. And they they make noises, too, Um mm-hmm. They, they don't have that yellow eye shine. It, they're just very, very different. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. And why do you think Wisconsin appears to be a hot spot for these creatures, or, or is it? Seems like it is, right? Or no? Well, it's a place where I receive a lot of reports, and I'm not sure if it really is the fact that there are more creatures here, although I, I do think they're, you know, that, that we are particularly blessed. But then there's also the fact that I'm probably really best known here because you know a lot of the local papers will pick up these these things all the time because um, I'm here and, and people hear about me so it just maybe that more people know to report it to me but I will say that I 
do map the sightings when they come in. I try and, and get some sense for where they're happening and what the bearing upon one another might be geographically, that sort of thing. And I've noticed that there are more sightings east of the Mississippi than west, although I get more and more from California and Texas sure. and Oklahoma lately. Um, but they also seem uh, particularly concentrated, not just around Wisconsin, but around the other Great Lakes states. Michigan has a lot of sightings. Um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, right on up to uh, New York, upper New York, um, and the western parts of that state. So it's like they're, they're very often attracted to water. And I've noticed um, there is almost always a good source of water nearby when there's a sighting. Hmm. That's interesting. I think you also mentioned before uh, elevation, too. Is that correct? Um, elevation seems more important with Bigfoot. It's one thing that I've noticed. Um, I, I have sort of this little microcosm, which is perfect for study here in southern Wisconsin, because we have an area called the Kettle Moraine State Forest, which is um, filled with one glacially made deep depression by another and then they're separated by ridges so we've got these and then they're right next to the prairie grasslands mm. and I have both Bigfoot and Dogman but I can almost draw you a line um, within the Kettle Moraine itself there are many many more Bigfoot it's almost exclusively Bigfoot and then you get out in the flatter areas and um, the Bigfoot come out there too but most of the Dogman sightings are in these wooded flatter areas so um, the, the Bigfoot, and I think I've seen this on, you know, written about, about by other researchers and, and uh, in some of the TV shows, the Bigfoot seems to, seems to like these hilly areas, um, and the Dogman seems to prefer um, slightly flatter ones, with exceptions, of course. I'm just speaking in generalizations. Mm, that's fascinating. Do you think they stake their territories from each other? I do. Yeah? That's what it I sounds do. like. That, yeah, that's a very good observation. And... Um, Part of the reason is is that I don't think that the um, their their individual uh, stomping grounds would seem so um, well delineated if they didn't sort of run one another out of each of these territories, but also their behaviors fit that so well because that would explain you know why would a predator run up and scare you to death and then run off? It's a classic um, bluff defense posture, you know, trying just to get you to run away from where it's hunting and uh, perhaps rearing its pups or whatever. And the Bigfoot has sort of um, its its own sort of defense postures. You know, it will roar at people, growl at people. Um, I personally feel I've been growled at by a Bigfoot. Um, it wasn't, wasn't pleasant. It was very, very scary. You know that something huge is making this sound. It was very close to me, maybe within 30 feet. And wow. you feel like you're this tiny mammal that could be gotten any time. Um, but I think it's a warning sort of thing, like get out of my territory. And um, many other reports of its behavior with other people, uh, you know, it, it just strikes me as sort of equivalent to the gorilla chest thumping. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. How do animals behave around the, the man wolf? Or have you tracked that at all? Well, um, pets, dogs especially, seem to get very, very frightened for the most part. And occasionally, they'll, people will tell me they're, uh, if they have a large dog especially, um, when the dogs go in and chase the creatures, either they're not seen again or they come back trembling, tail between the legs. Um, sometimes when people have said they were indoors and these creatures were outside, they reported that the dog would just become this sort of whimpering hulk and creep under a chair, and, you know, and not come out. I've heard the same thing with Bigfoot, too. Um, but they both have, I, I've heard tales of both of them um, taking people's dogs. Mm. So wow. there's a there's a real poignant, poignant story in uh, my forthcoming in the American Monsters book about um, that was told to me by a man who, along with his fiance at the time, was driving up in the northern part of the Kettle Moraine State Forest, and they passed a house that was right on the edge of it somewhere. Uh, um, they were a little bit lost on their way to wherever they were going, and there was a Bigfoot standing at the end of a driveway. Um, sort of as if it had been caught unaware and was kind of frozen in 
place. And this is something that I've, I've had reported to me. Many other investigators have reported the same thing. It's uh, sort of a known Bigfoot behavior is that they'll sort of freeze like a statue if they think they're being seen and they can't immediately run off. Hmm. This thing was standing there and it was holding out its arms and there was a dead white and black dog lying in its arms. Hmm. And they felt that it was sad for some reason that the dog was dead. They both got this feeling of sadness from it. Um, they saw it very clearly. It was daylight. They had a good look at it. They drove very slowly. But he said something just told them to keep going, mm -hmm. you know, and not to stick around. Maybe, again, it was that mental impression. Maybe the Bigfoot was able to send them that keep driving message. Mm -hmm. um, some people believe that the Bigfoot can emit infrasound, which is, you know, sound vibrations lower than um, the, the, the human ear can normally hear or interpret, um, some, such as some other uh, large animals like uh, a elephants can do that. Um, I think that porpoises are able to do it, some great cats. Um, so who knows, maybe that's another tool that the Bigfoot uses to make us feel, yeah, I should be moving along here. Mm -hmm. But that just that sight of the Bigfoot standing there holding out its arms with this dead dog in the arms, um, to me, is is just sort of a, a an image that I can't get out of my own head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. And and does the man wolf also have a different um, frequency associated as well, like the uh, Bigfoot? I haven't heard that. Uh, I haven't really heard anybody express that. It, with the man wolf, it's more just like um, this mental message, or the posturing, or um, you know, just the the fact that it's trying to instill fear. It has, um, it, interestingly, you know, lots of times when I go on a radio show, people will be playing uh, one of the Wolfman songs that involves howling. Uh -huh. and, and and the howling is, you know, just the standard cliche with werewolves. However, I've never really had anybody um, associate seeing the actual creature and hearing a howl. But I have had people who have seen it, hear it emitting a growl. And it's a very distinctive sound. And the people who have reported this to me in, um, I think, every case that I know of haven't known of anyone else or read about it any, anywhere, but yet they all report the same thing. And it's kind of an up-and-down, high-to-low, variable-pitch growl that mm. reminds me of what it reminds me of is those old cappuccino makers that would make this kind of, you know, from one high to low, high to low sound, right. uh, which, which is really different from a normal canine growl. And it just, you know, scared the living daylights out of them when they heard it. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Well, with that being said, we're going to head for a break real quick. We'll be right back. Everybody stay tuned.
Welcome back, everybody, to Hyperspace on Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Solaris Blurvin, and I'm here with my very special guest, Linda Godfrey, discussing her fascinating work and books on werewolves and the wolf man, or whatever you want to call him. Um, one of which to be released in August is titled American Monsters, a history of monster lore, legends, and sightings in America. And with that being said, how would people get a hold of you if they'd like to share some information with you, Linda? Well, the easiest way is to go to lindagodfrey.com. Um, which will bring you to my WordPress blog, and you can contact me from there. Um, I've got kind of a fledgling, fledgling Beast of Bray Road page that I'm still working on, trying to transfer my old beastofbrayroad.com site. Um, but you can find easily how to email me from um, either of those places, the, the Beast of Bray Road page or right at uh, my blog site, lindagodfrey.com. Excellent. Awesome. And, and do these creatures interfere with anything electrical, lights, cars, radios? I, I know you mentioned something about your own uh, electrical interruptions here and there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's, if it's uh, you know, anything to do with them. Um, I've never had anybody who was in a car or doing anything saying that they noticed an electrical disruption. You know, unlike people who encounter UFOs or even the Mothman, or some of the other things who will say, yeah, the, the car just stopped, um, you know, my, my phone went out. You know, I've never had anybody mention anything like that. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good to know. Let's do a check on that one. So what's your take on, is it possible these images could be generated on a holographic level, or perhaps a black um, military technology? Um, you know, that's something... I, I almost don't even feel qualified to speculate about if the military is indeed enhancing our world with large holographic images, um, you know, realistic images, things that seem to steal pets and livestock and chase our cars and things like that. I kind of feel like, boy, we are in trouble because there are a lot better things they could be doing, <laughs> you know, with our resources and the technology. And um, it's kind of similar to people who have suggested that perhaps these creatures are military um, biological experiments, you know, where they're trying to interbreed wolves and humans. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I, I mean, I never uh, count anything entirely out, but my my rejoinder to this would be, well, you know, to what end? What real advantage would you get with getting a, a half-wolf, half-man creature, even if it were possible to merge these two very different species, which, you know, normally just doesn't work well in, in any kind of nature um, because the, the, the DNA is just uh, too different. There are too many safeguards um, that make that very difficult to do. Um, not that I don't believe genetic experimentation is going on in probably ways that we, we can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I sort of believe that if it's anything that it's possible to be done scientifically is probably being done by someone somewhere, um, mm -hmm. if only in a very secret way. I agree. Yeah, if you can think about it, if it's usually existing somewhere in some dimension. But it reminds me of Wolverine from the X-Men. A little bit. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And if they, if they could, you know, somehow interbreed wolves and humans and get wolverines, yeah, they'd probably be doing it. But, you know, I, I think it's pretty much fantasy at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. And have you noticed any lights in the sky along with the, um, the sightings? That does get reported, yeah. And uh, I have a recent, fairly recent blog post, um, you know, that highlights a couple of these things. And it's it's something that um, I've paid more and more attention to as the years have gone by. Um, you know, I, I first started noticing that there seemed to be UFO sightings fairly frequently in many of the um, major sighting areas. Hmm. And then, um, and sometimes, you know, people would say they, they were UFOs, but um, really what they were seeing uh, could probably best be described as as anomalous lights more than anything else. And there's one in particular uh, incident in The Real Wolfman um, that was taken and made a TV show by Paranormal Witness on TV um, that I investigated. It's become known as the Maine Wolf Pack because it occurred in Maine, in the state of Maine. And uh, a, a woman who was, uh, at the time, a middle-aged professional woman, 
um, with, her, with her husband, were sitting out on their front porch, um, I think near Portland, Maine, when they got this ominous feeling. Now, they were sitting out there. It was their habit every night because they had a pond on their property, and deer would come to drink at the at the pond at night. And so they would sit drinking coffee on their front porch until about 1030 at night, and they kept a big spotlight out that occasionally they'd shine to see the deer. And they got this terrible feeling, and the woman picked up the spotlight and shined it. And to their horror, they discovered there were a total of five upright, wolf-like creatures walking on their hind legs, and they could tell they were about seven feet tall uh, compared to uh, an outbuilding door that uh, a couple of them were walking past. And not only that, they were really only um, 20-some feet away, and the creatures were flanking them. There were two coming from one direction and three from another. Hmm. And they were able to kind of back up into their farmhouse. They called 911. 911 told them to call the local uh, animal officer um, or, and our conservation warden. And those people just told them to stay in their house overnight. Well, which of course they did, although the husband made uh, two attempts to get out uh, to the truck or out to his guns, which were kept locked in an adjacent building. Um, wasn't able to do that. But they were able to look out the windows and see the five pairs of uh, yellow-green lights shining back, reflected in their flashlight. So these creatures stayed out there almost the whole night. Um, on TV, it sh- on TV, it showed them going to bed with axes and knives. <laughs> they didn't do that, you know. It it had the usual exaggerations. Uh, the, the TV show also showed wonderful imprints of uh, that looked very castable, as if they were made in mud. When really the family just saw uh, kind of impressions left in the grass. But there was the aspect that before they had this sighting, um, they had been seeing weird lights that they couldn't identify in some nearby trees. And um, the TV show exaggerated this portion again a little bit, but it was something that they had been seeing. Mm. So um, it was it was associated with this with this same uh, incident. And I've heard other other times when people have seen odd lights, you know, in, in mm. connection with the creatures. Right. That's very interesting. Now, is there superhuman strength associated with these creatures as well? Or special abilities? Yeah, they seem to, uh, they do seem to be very strong. Um, You know, they've been able to carry large uh, portions of meat or parts of of deer, um, that sort of thing, over their shoulders. Um, They've been able to bound and jump across roads in just a couple of steps or leap over fences. jump on top of roofs or on top one at one uh, group of people saw them um, saw one of them that had jumped up on top of a high uh, sign up in front of a church that they didn't know how it got up there hmm. um, it was able to um, jump on top of a, a missile silo um, in another state um, where some young boys were accustomed to go and catch it was an abandoned missile silo I might add uh, they used to go there to trap pigeons at night Hmm. Well, that's pretty interesting, without a doubt. Scary, very, very <laughs> scary. Yeah, and and they said this thing was, you know, up there on this silo that you know was a hard climb for them to make. Mm-hmm. And of course, they didn't dare go anywhere near it when they saw it sort of silhouetted, you know, in the moonlight. But when they did go back a couple nights later, um, this silo, which was a place where these pigeons roosted, and the boys would go down there with cages and uh, trap them, um, was like. Pigeon Armageddon. Something had taken these pigeons and just shredded them and kind of left the carnage all over. Wow. That's interesting. Are these sightings usually in the evening? Do they ever have any daylight sightings? There are daylight sightings. Um, I, I once did kind of a survey on the, uh, the sightings that I had collected at that particular time. And I think it probably still holds true that Probably most of the sightings, maybe uh, 75% or more, are seen between the hours of 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. But there are daylight sightings, and there are also um, sightings made at dusk or dawn. Hmm. So there, there are, uh, you know, it is seen at different times. 
um, which indicates that they're around not just at night, but but in the daytime too. Maybe they just take better care to hide themselves. I don't know. Um, and the same thing holds true for Bigfoot too. Yeah, that's very interesting. And also, there was mention of the legs were bent backwards. Is that correct? With these creatures or no? Yeah, um, and that's actually, um, it's a really good point. It's something that um, many witnesses will say it's one really important way to differentiate them from Bigfoot besides the canine head with the long muzzle and upright pointed ears. But people who see the dog man will say, and normally, um, you know, it's just how they're kind of groping for words to use their their own knowledge to describe these things. They'll say, well, you know, it was running really well on its hind legs, but they were bent backwards. And that tells me that they've made a really accurate observation of a dog man because canines run, uh, the fancy word is digitigrade, but the plain way of saying it would be on their toe pads. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, why we see the toes and we see, you know, what would be like the ball of our foot in, in their normal prints. Um, but where we're expecting to see uh, the knee joint bending forward, what we're actually seeing on them is the hock or what would be our heel and ankle joint, which bending, if you think about it, if you're on your toes, um, you know, those point toward the back and then your knee is still up bending forward and their knee would be closer up to what we would consider the thigh if you're, if you're comparing the two types of legs. Um, Bigfoot is flat footed. It's got the knee joint like ours. It's entirely different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's really, really hard for, uh, I think it's easier for a person to pull off um, imitating a Bigfoot in a suit than it is for a dog man because um, to really reproduce that very thin bone that leads to the toe pad is, is very uh, difficult. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's just not how, how we're made to look. But when they say the leg was bent backwards, that is what they mean. Wow, that's that's pretty incredible. It's very interesting. Yeah, in the old days, you know, of course, they, they talk about the silver bullet and all that. I think we discussed it a little bit. That could destroy the quote-unquote werewolf, according to myth. But has any witness ever taken a, a real shot at one of these things or tried to track or hunt it? Yeah, um, and this is actually something that I devoted some space to in the new book, uh, American Monsters, because it also occurs with um, Bigfoot and it occurs with some of the large uh, bat squatch type creatures. Um, something that happens time and time again when uh, someone who is armed happens to encounter these creatures. And normally, these are not people who are like out to hunt a werewolf, you know, with, with guns or anything. They're hikers who happen to be carrying a weapon uh, or fishermen who happen to be carrying a weapon. Um, people who are just out doing their normal thing and, and they happen to normally carry a gun and they encounter one of these creatures and uh, feel that they're threatened by it. one man was out in a shallow boat fishing just offshore and thought that the creature was going to go after his dog for instance mm -hmm. and so they will shoot and some of them have you know emptied uh, a, a semi-automatic clip into it and normally it will make the creature turn back or run away but when they pursue it, they don't ever find it. There's often not even a blood trail. Um, one that was reported to me said they, they saw where it looked like it had maybe fallen and staggered and broken some weeds or rushes, something like that. But um, they weren't able to find the creatures. So it's sort of as if they're bullet resistant. Hmm. And if they are indeed natural creatures... This shouldn't be um, because, right. you know, people do. I mean, here in Wisconsin recently, again, they've started wolf hunts. And when people go out and shoot the natural uh, gray or, or timber wolves, as some people call them, they kill them. And mm -hmm. they've got carcasses to show for them. Um, there's nothing different or supernatural about it. Whereas these unknown upright creatures, um, the bullets don't seem to affect them. Wow, that is supernatural. It sounds that way, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's almost like they've got a Kevlar vest underneath their fur. And it's interesting. Um, you might actually relate to this, uh, Solaris, because I noticed that uh, you have um, 
remote viewing as as one of your interests, mm-hmm. um, you know yourself. And um, when I w- when I wrote my second book on the topic, which was called uh, "Hunting the American Werewolf," I thought, well, I'm going to cast a really wide net because so many of the features of these animals um, are just kind of out there. I'm going to go for a wide variety of uh, possible explanations and let people just sort of apply them themselves if they want to. And one of the gentlemen um, that I talked to, and actually he contacted me, was a remote viewer who had been uh, trained by and formerly worked in the service of the U.S. government in remote viewing. And um, what he did was focus on a drawing that I made uh, that's in uh, several of my books that is uh, kind of my own forensic sketch based on uh, the aggregate of uh, features that people have described to me. Uh, I call it the indigenous dog man that, you know, show the ears and the muzzle and the expression and the way it holds its its uh, paws, you know, and, and stands. And he used that as his target source. And what he came up with was that he felt this was actually a, a very old species that came from somewhere else, um, another planet, another galaxy. He didn't know really, but he felt that they were, they had been sort of uh, genetically, genetically not bred with humans, but genetically engineered to kind of subsist here. And uh, that one of their features was that they did have this sort of hardened skin meant to be resistant to projectiles and human weapons. Um, And not only that, but at that their fur had sort of a bioluminescence to them. And I do hear lots of times people will say, well, the fur was dark brown or gray, but it had this sort of silver sheen to it, or there was sort of a, um, the, the, the fur was tipped with white. Um, I'll hear that now and then. Mm. Um, it, and also it explains the larger size. So, um, and by the way, he actually stopped going and remote viewing them because he felt there was sort of a blowback that they were kind of mm. aware at some point that he was observing them and began observing him, which right. was p- extremely unsettling <laughs> um, and made him decide to uh, stop looking at them. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, I've heard that also. Yeah, when you remote view, I've heard extraterrestrials, actually, that, that concept where they can actually remote view you back. So, yeah, that's fascinating. It really is. And, and how, how big are these things? I mean, what's the weight we're talking about here? The weight is generally described as between, say, 150 pounds and at very most close to 300. Usually it's more like 150 to 250, something like that. There's been a little confusion on a few television shows. Um, they've interviewed me about both uh, and, and interviewed witnesses of both the dog man and the Bigfoot and not made it real clear on TV which was which so that you would have... Some Bigfoot witnesses saying, well, yeah, it was 300 to 400 pounds, which is a very typical weight given for a Bigfoot sighting. And people think mistakenly that they're talking about the dog man, whereas the dog man weight is very seldom over, say, 250 at most, topping 300. And that's very unusual. Usually mm-hmm. it's 150 to 200. Wow. Yeah. And are you able to um, get any samples of the tracks? Um, I've had actually some really good pictures of one um one set of them that was made believe it or not in south milwaukee along uh, an old uh gravel road that leads to a cliff overlooking lake michigan and it's just a short road maybe a mile long um that actually is known as kind of a spooky lover's lane not, nothing to do with weird animals but uh, some young people were walking along it late at night hoping to see this spooky lane ghost and instead one of these creatures jumped out at them and chased them back to where the um town and the street lights began again and i was able to go out there within a week they didn't call but their mother called or actually their aunt had called their they had told their mother their mother told her sister and and it was that that aunt that called me and i went out and was walking along it with several of them in daylight with the camera and uh walked down a little tractor lane in this field um would have been impossible for anybody to know that we were going to walk down that lane but there was a mud hole maybe 10 feet in diameter something like that where there was this 
clay-like mud. And you could see, it was almost like watching a National Geographic special because you could see that a deer had run through and then its hind hooves deeply impressed into the mud as if it was springing out. And right behind it were these huge, six-inch wide, with claws, huge canine prints. And the deer tracks had not spread out. So I have to assume that the canine prints did not spread in the mud either, that this was their actual mud. And then you could actually see there was another impression where you could tell the canine was also kind of rearing back to spring after the deer because the hock um, area or the heel area had uh, c- come down into the mud to sort of give it that extra boost that it needed to spring out of it. And so overall, it made these prints, um, you know, over eight inches long mm. and then about six inches wide. But you could see the um, the prints perfectly. Now, I had not at that time expected to find anything of the sort. And I didn't have casting material with me. And actually, at that point, I was um, lucky to be out there because I was undergoing radiation treatment at the time for a bout of cancer that I had uh, seven years ago. Um, but I did have very good uh, prints of them which appear in uh, my book and, and uh, you can find them if you kind of go through the old uh, website beastofbrayroad.com which is at the time static but still has a lot of good old stuff on it that I just haven't gotten around to removing yet. Oh, that's incredible and glad you're still with us by the way. Glad you're okay. Oh thank you. So am I. <laughs> yeah you're a blessing for sure. I love your work. i just so thrilled thank to you. have you on. So and what about skeletons and bones? Have you Have you been able to locate anything like that? Well, here's the thing about that. Um, I think that if you found, for instance, the skeleton of um, a 10-foot tall bird man or a Bigfoot, you would know, or, or a dead body, say, you would know kind of what you had and that it was really unusual and, and different because it would just not look like anything or conform to any known species. But if you found a dead wolf man or dog man, um, even though it had slightly elongated paws, you really wouldn't know for certain that you had anything other than a dead wolf or wolf-dog hybrid because they don't have the human features. They still have tails. They've got, you know, the same jaws. Um, you know, their their legs and feet are configured like canines. Mm-hmm. And you might say, wow, that's kind of a weird-looking, really big dead wolf man or, or dog man. And timber wolves, uh, I've got some pictures uh, for instance, of uh, captured timber wolves that are dead and they're um, hanging up and they measure seven feet tall, um, you know, when they're hung as if they would be standing up. Mm-hmm. So they can be that long and still, uh, uh, you know, be nothing more than a natural animal. So I think if you did find one of their carcasses, it would be very hard to tell whether you had um, a natural animal or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. I think, I think we touched a little bit on, the, but what about paranormal anomalies associated with these eyewitness sightings? Anything really unusual that stands out in association on a more esoteric level? Well, there are the anomalous, anomalous lights, um, you know, and I've I've just got this feeling more and more that they may be associated with something that we might think of as portals or um, openings to other dimensions, that Mm -hmm. sort of thing. So that's the main one that stands out for me with these creatures, um, other than the the seeming telepathic um, or empathic messages that people seem to get from them. Mm -hmm. Um, Occasionally, um, I'll have somebody say that they've seen it seem to morph Um, but it's not like it's changing into a human being in most cases Um, people have mentioned it changing into something like an ape-like being or um, just moving real fast or once or twice that it has seemed to be partially uh, translucent or transparent or it'll be compared to um say, the the camouflage predator in the Predator movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Again, these are really the the, uh, small minority of sightings, but they they do occasionally come through with these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And haven't they been seen around Native American medicine mounds or ceremonial mounds as well? Yes, yes. And especially in Wisconsin, this is a connection that I made and uh, kind of elaborate on in uh, Hunting the American Werewolf. 
I was looking one day at a map um, in a book on Indian effigy mounds in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin is quite unique, especially southern Wisconsin, because it has, I think the, the percentage is something like 96% of all the ancient animal-shaped effigy mounds in the world. Now, there's there are overlaps onto adjoining states, and then Ohio has the Great Serpent Mound, which is, you know, an amazing one. But when it comes to the animal-shaped effigy mounds, not not just the geometric or round cone-shaped ones, um, they're amazingly concentrated um, by this later stage of mound builders in southern Wisconsin. And I noticed that the sightings of a particular shape that often were called by the settlers lizard mounds or panther mounds because they had long tails. We now know that they're more accurately called water monster mounds um, because they're associated with uh, nearby water. Mm-hmm. Seem to be almost the exact same configuration as a map I had of uh, not necessarily individual sightings, but hot spots of sightings in southeastern Wisconsin. Um, I overlaid them and they laid they were almost perfect, you know, um, and I've done that at talks that I give. I do give library and conference talks. And um, I used to uh, tell you how long I've been doing this. i I used to use uh, transparency slides rather than the PowerPoint, which I've now gone to. But when I would lay one map down and lay the transparency, of the other over it of the between the uh, effigy mount places and these particular types of sightings, the audience would just gasp because it was almost perfect. Mm-hmm. And this actually, when I uh, at the time I discovered it, um, I had been trying without success to get an interview with um, an elder of our Wisconsin Ho Chunk tribe. They used to be called the Winnebago, but uh, their name for themselves was closer to Ho Chunk, and um, they're very uh, tend to be very close off uh, to the outer world, especially when it comes to their legends and lore. But uh, when I told them what I had discovered, I almost instantly got an interview with um, a woman who's not only a tribal elder uh, but an anthropologist, and they are very interested in any things related related to these um, effigy mounds because their people who were here when the settlers came. Um, said these mounds have been here, you know, our, they, they were made by our grandfathers, meaning ancestors. Um, you know, they weren't here when, when we ourselves settled. Mm-hmm. So they've been trying to learn about them themselves. And, um, you know, I was told that uh, this this made a lot of sense to them, um, this idea that these mounds were correlated. And the idea that they thought was most likely, and that I've also heard from other tribes, is that, these creatures that, especially the ones that seem to be um, sometimes at least partly supernatural, are manifestations of spirit beings that were left there, maybe conjured up, put in place. Uh, you know, it's hard to say nowadays what the method was, but they were left there to guard their sacred spaces, whether they were burial mounds or the effigy mounds, because not all the effigy mounds have burials in them. A lot of them. Um, you know, or are just there for other spiritual purposes. Um, but they were put there to guard these places. And at the time when the settlers came and began, unfortunately, plowing over these mounds, digging into them, desecrating them, um, that that released these creatures to appear and uh, pretty much object <laughs> to wow. having their spaces invaded. Yeah, that sounds, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think so, too. Yeah. Almost reminds me of gargoyles a little bit. Mm -hmm. A strange place. And also Anubis, too. Yes, and you know, it's amazing that you should mention that Anubis because um, a lot of people have compared these creatures to Anubis, especially, this is another little subset of the more supernatural type of sightings. Um, People will sometimes see, instead of the regular wolf-like thing, um, when, especially when they're related to cemeteries, um, I had one that was seen at the Great Lakes Naval Base Cemetery just north of Chicago. When they're related to cemeteries or they appear inside people's houses, believe it or not, wow. I call these bedroom invaders, <laughs> they will very often compare them to um, the jet black, tall, 
pointy-eared Anubis, which many people know uh, was the god of the dead or the underworld, to the ancient Egyptians. Um, and was uh, for many years thought of as, as a, a jackal, but recently they have found out that actually it portrays a type of wolf that was then um, uh, uh, active in, in ancient Egypt. So we are back to the, the dog and the wolf dog combination but but yeah there seems to be some association um, between these other things and it's interesting because uh, when these creatures appear in people's houses or their bedrooms they're not like the aliens um, that appear and are, seem to be taking people they're not malevolent they're not um, like the spirits that jump on people's chests and seem like they're choking them you know the what we call the, the hag riders or the um, incubus or succubus um, type of things. Instead, pe- usually there, there may be one or there may be two. People will say they seem more like, almost like tourists, like they're visiting, they're looking around, they have this majestic presence, and then they just dematerialize, vanish right in front of their eyes. Hmm. Wow, it's like visiting their old space. Yeah, or or a new space, you know, almost, they seem to me, these seem the most to me like the interdimensional visitor type. Mm-hmm. That's just fascinating. Yeah, I wouldn't mind encountering one of those. I think that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, and how long have these sightings been around in America? We've talked about the Native American con- connection there, but what about the oldest recor- record of contact or sighting with a, with a wolf man or man wolf? Well, the ones that seem like those that are reported to me, um, the earliest sort of go back to the 1930s. There are old newspaper reports of hairy, upright creatures. Um, some of them sound a little more wolf-like. Some sound more like they might have been Bigfoot. Usually the descriptions in the old newspapers aren't really great or detailed, and it's hard to tell exactly what they were. Um, there are also... Um, you know, the old fur trapper tales that go back to the 1600s. Um, some Native American tales um, correlate them with a type of spirit creature called the Wendigo. And this gets really confusing. The Wendigo is actually, in most cases, associated with um, the northern woodland Indians who would encounter some real bad problems with starvation sometimes and um, oftentimes humans that resorted to cannibalism were said to go windigo or turn windigo and then they turned into this half spirit half human creature oftentimes they were mostly comprised of ice um, or they'd be a huge human with an ice heart um, or sometimes the ice creature would melt down and then you'd find the shriveled up little human inside it and, or maybe the shriveled up heart. They kind of go across, you know, above, uh, across the map. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're confused with Bigfoot. Sometimes they're accused, uh, or confused with the wolf man. Um, so you could sometimes say maybe the Wendigo goes really far back in ancient Native American lore. But it's very hard to pin it down precisely always correlated with these upright dogmen. But the the types of reports that I normally get of something that's almost all or totally canine, running on the hind legs, not eating people, um, running off when it's confronted, yellow eyes shine, those seem to go back to, say, around the 30s. Hmm. That's interesting right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And have you actually talked with some shamans or magical practitioners pertaining to the werewolf or the wolf wolf man? And were they able to provide you with any extra information? Is it something that they pull in with their ceremonies at all? Um, I, I've talked with one or, few, one or two that were um, sort of friendly and helpful, um, that sort of hinted. They weren't saying they necessarily did it, but they sort of hinted they, they knew more about it. You know, one man had the, the term walker in his surname, you know, which, which gave a hint right there. Mm-hmm. I It's more likely that I sometimes get um, emails or even letters. Um, sometimes they've been from people who hinted that they were skinwalkers um, and that I may, they think that I may be revealing too much about them. And when honestly, I think there's a ton 
that goes on in that process in mm -hmm. terms of uh, practices and uh, training and that sort of thing that I honestly don't want to know about right. and that I don't delve into and that I certainly don't, uh, you know, disclose to people. Um, I've also heard from people who claim to be actual traditional werewolves who need to be chained up in the basement hmm. once a month and that they feel they literally grow fur um, and that, you know, they, they run out and, and prowl and, and uh, predate upon people and pets and things like that. Hmm. And I my, my response is, if you know you're physically doing this, next time you get uh, somebody to chain you up, have them put a video camera on a tripod and you know please send me the video of yourself transforming so that I can verify this and and nobody has ever done that yeah so um, you know I can't I can't validate what they're saying um, I will say that there is also uh, psychologists have told me there is a, a type of psychosis that people can have where um, they can say look in a mirror and when they they look at themselves during this particular time, they see themselves as covered with fur. They can look at their hand even and and see it covered as fur, whereas somebody else might look at them and not see anything different than a human being. Mm. In other words, they're viewing themselves, and this is an entirely different thing than the skinwalker or um, the other type of of transformational mm. processes. Mm. Um, it it's more of a psychological thing, and so you've got. All these different types playing in. There's also a, an actual physical condition um, where people grow fur. Um, it's genetically, uh, it, it's inherited genetically. There's a family in Mexico called, I think they're called the, the Ramos family, where there are at least 15 or 16 uh, descendants of a, a woman who had this condition. And um, they, there are two brothers who end up who have ended up um, working for circuses and, and uh, uh, they've become aerialists and, and do other things. Um, and we know about these same types of people back in medieval times who were often taken as sort of uh, court novelties by, by kings. We, there are photographs of them in, and drawings of them in uh, very fancy court or medieval dress. Mm -hmm. But they're not anything other than human with extra hair. It's like uh, we all sort of carry this latent hair gene that is switched off in almost all humans and for some reason in a small percentage of the population it gets turned on somehow. And uh, this, there's a, a guy in China who calls himself a uh, hair boy um, who has wanted to be a rock musician but um, his hair grew so thickly that he almost became uh, deaf from it growing in his ears. He had to have it you know, lasered out of his ears and wow. and partly off from around his eyes to keep from growing too much. You know, so there yeah. are reasons. <laughs> it's you amazing. know, we're, we're generally yeah, not not having it anymore. So you you have to look at all these different types and permutations of of the combination. And maybe those people are where the original idea of werewolves came from. You know, mm -hmm. when uh, because they do appear, uh, you know, they, they pop up every once in a while, um, this mutation to turn off that gene will show up and you'll, and you'll get these people. Right. But they're really only people. They don't howl, they don't you know, have claws, right. you know, or fangs, and they have normal noses and, and ears, and, mm -hmm. and uh, there's nothing really canine about them. Exactly. And what about that, you know, the one you described about having to be in the basement during certain times of the month or whatever. It sounds to me like they almost might be possessed or obviously they could have a, a psychological issue. But what about possession? In general, um, have you ever come across anybody who's who's possibly been possessed by something like that? Well, you know, that's something that's really hard for me to determine. I would mm -hmm. leave that up to specialists in that um, in that field. And I've heard more than a few people either say that they feel these creatures could be demons, outright demons, you mm -hmm. know, which would indicate that they're um, from, you know, another dimension or place. Um, or that they are possessed, that they think this. And um, again, there there are um, certain psychological conditions where people will feel that, that they're doing this uh, sort of thing. Actually, on Bray Road, um, there was a gentleman who lived not too far from there who, if he didn't take his medicine, would believe he was the beast of Bray Road and 
would occasionally run and hop on a car naked, believing that he was being seen as a furred creature, but yet people would just instantly call 911 and say, naked man just jumped on our car, you know, because they, <laughs> they, they couldn't see, see anything to him. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, so I, I think, again, there are a lot of, of different diagnoses you could make. And, um, you know, there, uh, for instance, there's a fungus called ergot that grows on um, wet rye in the field, and it can cause people to uh, have that same sort of hallucination that they feel they're a werewolf or some type of uh, similar creature and just sort of act really bizarrely and strangely. And it, there have been times when it uh, would affect whole villages, especially back in medieval days where um, you know grain storage wasn't real great or fields would get wet and, and uh, the, this uh, fungus would grow. And then uh, people would get this this ergot infection. Again, they didn't grow fur or anything, but um, they would begin acting that way. Yeah, I've heard about that actually. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's very very interesting. And I know you've made some mention in the past about these um, these creatures being seen at crossroads too. Is that correct? Yeah, this is really baffling because again, as I mentioned, I like to go to a map, um, not just Google Earth, but I'll use you know good old fashioned atlases and. Um, whatever else I can find. And I like to look at where, where there's a sighting, not just where other sightings have been nearby, but I look at the geography, um, the geology, what sort of, and also what sort of human or cultural artifacts are nearby. And I find that a lot of the time, where especially where you've got hot spots of sightings, um, they are along the same sorts of places known in Europe as old sacred places or um, spirit hot si- hot spots. Excuse me, hot spots, um, especially for phantom black dogs and things like that. And these include uh, roadsides, crossroads, uh, churchyards, cemeteries, military places. Any sort of old sacred place, especially sacred springs, um, they're the same sorts of places. And in in areas where you have so much, um, uh, where cities are building up so much that a lot of the old um, simple road crossroads are disappearing to be replaced by interstates, I'm getting reports where the often on-ramps to these interstates, um, people are seeing the dog man or, or wolf man on uh, these often on ramps or, or uh, cloverleaf areas. Mm, that's very interesting. And it makes sense, actually. Well, it, yeah, it does. You know, um, it, it, and again, it just gives me this eerie feeling that maybe there is more to them than just the natural animal. Sometimes I can also um, look at it from a natural point and say, well, if you look at military spots and sacred places, they're usually both built on high spots which and near fresh water, which are also desirable places for animals to look for prey, and, and they need the water as much as anything else. Um, the same with the, mm-hmm. the springs. And with the roads and the crossroads, um, you can also postulate that, well, Bigfoot and Dogmen um, aren't stupid they they like to uh you know make tracks and and cover great distances and it's much easier to run along a, a ditch than to slog through brambles and and thick woods you know so um it's interesting though because one other area where both are seen is places uh with power stations and ha- heavy duty electric lines sure. um they'll be seen running along those so there you have to wonder, okay, again, is it the fact that it's easier to run or is it that they're somehow attracted to the power right. emitted by these things? Are they able to feed off the energy or do they feel, um, you know, do, do they have some other benefit from um, this this electric energy that's being uh, given off? Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Yeah, it's a supernatural kind of thing. And also, have you looked at the ley lines of the earth and, and have you noticed any... Any type of a uh, connection between their their where you've seen them and actually around those ley lines in general? Um, well, you know, I know that's been noted, especially in Great Britain, 
with um, the sightings of the anomalous great cats and the black dogs and um, things like that. Um, and and I do, I've read about them and I've looked at them um, at some length, but I haven't really noticed a big connection with ley lines, although um, I've noticed a repetition of um, latitude and longitude numbers with hmm. respect to sightings areas. And I went, I went into this somewhat in my book, um, The Michigan Dog Man, Werewolves and Other Unknown Canines Across the USA. Um, you know, I just I looked at Bray Road and some other spots and just kind of compared them. And to my uh, surprise, um, I, the same numbers kept repeating, um, what, much more than you would expect it to occur by by mere chance. Mm. So um, that that was interesting. And yeah. those, of course, are not the same thing as ley lines. You know, the ley lines are the, the straight lines between the sacred places. Mm -hmm. And latitude and longitude is more of a man-made measurement of, you know, the, 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 um, the circumferences of the, of the earth and the globe. Um, but yet, they seem to correlate in some sort of ge geometric fashion. That's fascinating to me. That, that means something significant, if you ask me. I think so, too. I think it can't just occur by chance, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, because it's nothing that any individual witness notices unless they happen to, to know it on their GPS. Well, this is where I saw it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that may have been what alerted to me to it was when people started saying, well, I know I, I did look on my GPS and I was at here and here because people will often try to help be very helpful as to the exact location where the sighting occurred. Mm hmm. You know, and I think that may have been what made me start to uh, look up these sorts of uh, connections. Right. Well, it reminds me of the stargates or vortexes in those areas might be opening or closing. It's just, it's very interesting. Right. It yeah. does. And I, I do have, um, in case anybody has that, that book, The Michigan Dog Man, Werewolves, and Other Unknown Canines, um, I've got a little section titled Ley Lines and Water on uh, page 195 that talks about these these things compared to the ley lines as I've just said and I'll just mention here um, just for fun I looked up the coordinates for Wisconsin's ancient Mississippian pyramids at Aztalan for Bray Road and for the Yucatan's great Mayan center of Chichen Itza with its ancient astronomical observatory and these were just things I kind of thought of at random that I thought well yeah, let's just see if these connect the longitudes are 88 88.85, 88.852, and 88.34 west, respectively, all between only half a degree from 88, um, mm. which just seems kind of weird. And with the latitudes, I found that Aztalan, um, Big Rapids, Michigan, which is the dog man hot spot, and La Crosse, Wisconsin, where the man bat, lizard man, and others have been seen, are all very close to 43 degrees north latitude. Hmm. That's incredible. And that, I mean, that's just touching the surface. This is right. just me saying, okay, at random, I'm going to pick these, and lo and behold, there they all were. It would be really interesting to do a full study, which is just something I haven't really had time to right. do, and take all the known sightings and compare them with these other great known sacred spaces and see what you come up with. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, I hope you do do that. Yeah, a full study. I would love to see you... Um Start start really correlating all this data. That's fascinating to me. I, don't I may get into that in my next book that yeah. um, that I'll be writing. Not the one that's coming out, but um, I'm kind of working along those lines for for the next one coming up. So excellent. Yeah, that's huge. If you ask me, there's just something to it. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. It, and it surprised me as much as finding the correlation with these ancient uh, effigy mounds. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're really plugged in. Yeah, your psychic radars in full full speed ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and you know we're getting ready to wrap this up pretty soon, but I want to make sure everybody gets um, access to your website again. So why don't you go ahead and let everybody know how they can get a hold of you and your books and your websites. Yes, it's just the easiest way is lindagodfrey.com. I'm also on Facebook. Um, I've got several. There's a, a group, a Facebook group called Unknown Creatures Spot where I'm very active. Um, I'm on as Linda S. Godfrey for my author page. Um, just a general site, Linda Godfrey, which is more all over the map, but Linda S. Godfrey. And I've also got a page for God Johnson, 
The Unforgiven Diary, which is my um, debut fantasy book. Awesome. Yeah, I do want to thank you for being on with us tonight. It's been awesome to have you on. So thank you for joining us. And I hope to have you back. We still have some time. I just wanted to make sure I, I plugged your work so everybody can thank access you. that. Yeah, your books are incredible. And I want everybody to, uh, yeah, you know, just stay up late sometime and have some tea and, and read. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always a good plan in, in, in my world. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. And have you noticed these sightings being more active around, say, Halloween by chance? Um, the thing is, I've noticed there's there's always an uptick, not necessarily Halloween, although sometimes, but I, I think if it's on Halloween, it's mostly because more people are out at night, late into the night. Mm. And the same with full moons. There's no correlation I can see other than that. Maybe a few more people are out, and it's easier to see by the light of the full moon. And so I think those are the correlations. And in the fall, um, at least around in the Midwest, um, sightings do go up as soon as the corn gets high. And I think it's because all types, of not just with the dog man, but with the Bigfoot, they can get around in these cornfields without being seen. And the cornfields are like smorgasbords. They're full of deer, they're full of raccoon, all kinds of wonderful prey animals that are in there chowing the corn down. And these things can go in and, and hunt and also get places they ordinarily can't go without being seen. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense right there. Yeah. And, and I don't know if we have enough time or not, but I did want to touch on the swamp beast of southern Georgia. Wasn't there something uh, with the man wolf that appeared over there? Well, this was, um, yeah, down in southern Georgia, there was a man, a uh, prof- very professional man with a high placement in his given profession who didn't want to be um, known but for um, hobbies. He would go, he at one time leased the swampland both for hunting feral hogs and for uh, looking for um, ancient Native American relics, arrowheads, and things like that. And he actually uh, came upon a really large, terrifying version of this creature at least twice. Um, mm-hmm. Once when he was by himself, um, and then another time when he had uh, his uh, hunting partner with him. And uh, they released two well trained um, feral hog hunting dogs into the swamp chasing after this creature and these were the type that I mentioned before came whimpering back with their tails between their legs um, you know having really been uh, scared off by this thing but um, it was uh, just a a slightly different once in a while I hear this variation that it has the pointed triangular ears on top of the head but they have sort of tufts on the ears Um, and I've also been getting another weird variation Uh, mostly from Southern California, but a couple of times from um, these Southern swamps too, where they'll describe um, mostly canine, but that seems to have some feline features to it. And I don't know if this really means that it's a a dog cat or a cat dog or um, one called it a a Doberman cat. Because again, uh, you know, felines and canines are genetically incompatible, mm-hmm. or whether it's just that they have certain certain features that look sort of uh, cat-like or whatever. But um, yeah, this is something else that I've been getting the the past few years too. So it's like there's always something new, some new twist to it. Oh, absolutely, and I'm sure there'll be more down the road. And with that being said, everybody, I want to thank you all very much for tuning in tonight, and please stay tuned for Capricorn or Capricorn Philosophy Hour coming up next. And thank you again for um, for tuning in tonight. And thank you, Keith, over there. And I think that's it. It's about a wrap here. Thanks and, for having me. And thank you, Linda. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Oh, actually, it's Astronomy Cast coming up next on Dark Matter Radio Network, so stay tuned. 